I think my legacy is defined by winning. Jay, I've won at every level. Welcome to The Limits, I'm Jay Williams. That was one of my personal heroes, a true legend in every sense of the word, Magic Johnson. And like you heard him say, Magic stays winning. In college, he led Michigan State to a victory over the previously undefeated Indiana State in the 1979 NCAA championship game. This is still, to this day, the most watched college basketball game in history. During 13 seasons with the LA Lakers, Magic won five rings, five championships. Think about that. He was a 12-time All-Star, three-time NBA Finals MVP, and three-time league MVP. He played on the Olympic team, the dream team actually, with Michael Jordan and Larry Bird, and won the gold medal. But you see, Magic is not just a winner. He's a trailblazer on and off the court. He opened Magic Johnson movie theaters in black neighborhoods across the country. At one point, he owned 125 Starbucks stores. And today, he has ownership stakes in three Los Angeles teams, the Dodgers, the Sparks, and the LAFC soccer team. But for Magic, it's never been just about making money for himself. Even when he got his devastating HIV diagnosis in 1991, with the support of his beloved wife, Cookie, he made it his mission to raise public awareness on the issue. I have so much admiration for this man, and we talked about it all. We'll come back to basketball and that diagnosis in a bit, but I want to start off with Magic today, the businessman. Here's my conversation with the great Magic Johnson. One of the things um, that I've always been so just proud of how you've been so open about this is the power to build companies within the black community. And I know that after the LA riots that erupted after the beating of Rodney King, you pivoted to becoming essentially a businessman. And ultimately I, that led to you having movie theaters in black communities. Just take me through a little bit of that process, Magic. Yeah, I think Jay, you know, people underestimate us uh, as athletes and that you're not only smart as an athlete, that means you're smart in life too. <laughs> you know, you, <laughs> I mean, you can't remember all the, your own plays, the opponent plays, and where everybody's supposed to be and not be smart. And so I've always knew that I wanted to become a businessman. I, I, I just had to get mentors to help me understand business. And so I was smart enough to get mentors who gave me great advice and uh, who helped me get started. And so the LA riots really jump-started my business life after, after the riots because we tore down our own community. Latinos, African-Americans, they tore down and burned down our own businesses. So now we had a problem because now all these storefronts were were gone, but also all these jobs were gone. And so I said, I gotta do something about that. And so Jay, I built these theaters, but what it did was, it was a place where minorities could go take their family, right in their own community, but also it created a lot of jobs, mm -hmm. construction jobs and jobs working within the four walls of the theater as well. My first theater came in top 10 highest grossing theaters in the nation. Everybody was shocked. Wait a minute. How is Magic making that type of money at a theater where they thought they were going to burn it down, tear it down, tear it up, and it never happened? That actually gave me the track record I needed, so it built six of them, Jay. Magic Johnson Theaters. Mm -hmm. And the great thing I did was this. I talked to all my friends. I said, when you have your movie premiere, you can have it right here in the hood. Smart. And Michael Jackson Smart. had that great, um, he, he, it wasn't a thriller and all that wasn't just a video. It was like a movie. It's the first time any artist did something like a movie, you know. So guess where we had the premiere? <laughs> At the Magic Johnson Theater. Now, I have Michael Jackson in the neighborhood. Man, people went nuts, man. They went crazy, you know. And then from then on, everything changed. The mindset of people 
about urban America. And so uh, because of that success, I was riding in New York and I looked and I said, what is a, what's that line for? And they mm -hmm. said, that, that line is for Starbucks. I said, Starbucks? What's Starbucks? Man, that's a coffee place. I said, I, man, I got to try this Starbucks. Everybody waiting in line. So I had my, uh, my security dude. I said, go in there and grab me some tea because I don't drink coffee, but I drink tea like I have right now. I said, so he came back, man, had that peach tea, man. That, man, I tasted that tea. I said, oh, that's it. <laughs> Jay, I said, this is the next thing I'm taking to the hood. <laughs> so that was just all random, man. All random. Just... All random. Wow. I saw Latinos in line, African Americans in line, whites in line, all different type of people in line to go get this great Starbucks coffee. And I said, we need that in urban America. And sure enough, I cold called Howard Schultz and said, hey, we're playing Seattle Supersonics. Can I come in and see you the day before the game? He said, sure. So flew up, met with him, said, hey, I'm doing these great things in the inner cities with my, my movie theaters. Uh, you should bring Starbucks into the inner city, and we should partner to do it. He said, look, Magic, we don't have franchisees. I said, I'm not here to become one. You put up half the money. I put up half the money. Let's build these Starbucks. And I tell you, it's going to be a home run. And now the hard part comes which is me proving to everybody that this thing could work in urban America. Man, when we opened, Jay, the line was down the block, man. It was incredible. And sure enough, Howard looked at me and said, you called it. You said it was going to be successful. And we built 125 Starbucks in 40 different markets, man. My per caps were higher than his per caps. I mean, <laughs> uh, we, we changed the game, brother, with that one. Well, Magic, because you, you also knew something that, you know, you can cater to your customer. That's right. right? Like, like, we would talk about this. I'm like, y'all know we just were in Starbucks and they were playing Marvin Gaye? That's right. <laughs> y'all know that, right? Y'all got, like, little sweet potato pies That's down right. here. I don't see that in some of these other areas. That, that was genius on your part. Well, because, see, to what you just said earlier, understanding the customer, over-delivering to that customer by taking out scones, things that we don't know nothing about, we don't eat as minorities. You put in that sweet potato pie, you take out the music that they normally play in suburban Starbucks, and you put in, like you said, Marvin Gaye, Michael Jackson, Prince, Beyonce, on and on and on. Now people say, hey, in urban America, they say, this is my spot. This is my Starbucks. I'm going to go to this coffee house every single time because they have everything that I like. And so it was unbelievable. It's still unbelievable, you know, to think about what I was able to do and then create a whole new market for Starbucks because now they built thousands of stores in urban America. Magic, you know, when I got drafted in 2002, my agent and I had this conversation around, you know, there was Jason Williams that played for the New Jersey Nets then there was the one who was, <laughs> real talk, was probably the baddest one for the Sacramento Kings, White Chocolate. He was, oh, he was special. And my agent kind of floated out the idea, you know, maybe we should just, you know, change your name to Jay. My mom and I kind of turned it down. The next day in the New York Post, Jason Williams changes his name to Jay, and everybody starts calling me Jay Williams from that point on, right? And almost in a way a little bit of an alter ego forms. And there was a little bit of a difference between Jay and Jason. That's right. Right? As Jay ventured into the world. And I know like Irvin Magic, the Showtime Magic, and you came out with a new Apple TV Plus docuseries, They Call Me Magic, that talks about these two sides of you. There's a flashy extrovert called Magic, but then there's Irvin who's quieter, more introspective, who I feel like we're talking to. There's It goes back and forth, similar to me. How do you balance these two sides of you? with all the things you have going on? Well, Jay, it's easy. Magic will tear your head off. I, 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 listen, you trying to get something I want. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I may be smiling, but you try to play cards and uh, checkers and mm. uh, basketball and on and on and on. I'm a competitive 
crazy guy. I love to win. That's magic all day long. And he'll do whatever it takes to win. Urban is completely different. Magic loved the spotlight and loved people and the whole thing. Urban loved to get away from that. And so he's, he liked to stay home. Like this weekend, I just stayed home all weekend. I took my wife to see a, a movie. So Urban just want to be walking with Cookie and or sitting uh, on a lawn chair or on the beach just talking to her, enjoying my family, man. That's who I am. I'm a family man. I love my kids. I love my grandchildren. So that's Urban. He's just away from all the limelight and all the way away from all the stuff. So that's the difference between the two. And I know when to turn magic on. So if I'm out and that elevator says ding and it opens up, Hey, hi everybody. I'm smiling, <laughs> high-fiving, taking pictures, you know. And then Urban knows when to just be quiet and just relax. And so um, that's the difference between the two. This is The Limits from NPR. I'm Jay Williams. We heard from Magic Johnson about his accomplishments as an entrepreneur and a leader in his community. But of course, he got his name recognition, his connections, and like he said, many of his skills from the basketball court. Magic went to the Lakers as the first overall pick in the 1979 NBA draft. In 1981, he signed a 25 year, $25 million contract with the Lakers, the highest paying contract in sports history up to that point. At the end of the decade, he was on top of the world with five NBA championships, ultimately changing the game with his style of the play. And then because in the year 1991, everything changed. The HIV virus that I have attained, uh, I will have to retire from the Lakers. Let's hear what he had to say. So, Magic, I, one of the reasons I was really excited for this interview is not only do I emulate you in some of the moves you make business-wise and personality and how I see you treat people, but I, I truly believe that everybody I've had on my podcast and a lot of people in the world uh, some people more extreme than the others have gone through their sort of accident. Like I had a quote unquote motorcycle accident, but life happens to people. One of the things that happened to you was in 1991, you got diagnosed with HIV. And I, I know this is a very serious topic for you. How did you deal with that initial process of making that announcement? You know, listen, it was difficult to comprehend and deal with because I was in the prime of my career. And to go into the doctor's office and hear that devastating news, man, that I had HIV, uh, that, was, that was the toughest, toughest thing I've ever had to deal with ever in my life. You know, you think you've done everything right, you know, your whole life in terms of in your basketball career, make the right decision, make the right moves. And now all that comes tumbling down. And then he tells me, I probably can't play no more. Oh man. But more than that, Jay, it was the fact that now the, the, the unknown, because I tried to ask him, am I going to be here? Because most, what I knew about HIV and AIDS, most people die. So, that was really on my mind. Am I going to be here? What's going to happen to me? I'm, I just got married to my beautiful wife, Cookie. She was pregnant with our son, EJ, at that time. And I asked him, what does that mean for her and the baby? He didn't know because they had to run a test on both of them. So after trying to get myself together, after a couple hours being in the doctor's office, and asking him questions like, okay, what do I have to do to be here? He said, hey, you got to take your meds. You have, to have, you have to have a positive attitude. You have to now accept your new status. Um, I said, okay, I can do those things. But it's going to kill me for the next week or two to just worry about whether Cookie is healthy or not and the baby, right? And it did, man. It drove me absolutely crazy. Going home from the doctor's office to our home, 
now to tell her that I have HIV was the hardest thing I ever had to do. Not knowing what she was going to do, her reaction. And sure enough, I got home and told her. And Jay, I told her, I said, I can, I can understand if you want to leave. You know, I, I, I get it. And man, she hit me so hard upside my head. <laughs> and she said, you know what? We're going to beat this together. And that's when I knew I was going to be here for a long time. Because if she had a left, I probably wouldn't be sitting here on in this interview right now, right? I needed my parents. I needed my wife. I needed them to support me just to be there so I could talk to them about what I was going through every single day. And I needed that hug from Cookie. I needed that hug from my mother. I needed my father just to look at me and say, son, you're going to be okay. You know, I would say my support system helped me through it. My teammates helped me through it. Dr. Jerry Buss, I'm going to tell you something. He stood up big time, Jay. He stood up big time. Said, I'm going to pay you all your money. Now, on the flip side of that, a lot of the sponsor dropped me. Why was that, Magic? You know, during that time, it was like nobody talked about HIV and AIDS. You had to whisper about it. Thank God we've changed that now, but it took a lot of hard work and a lot of... Uh, meetings and people coming together to make people understand that you don't have to discriminate against somebody who have HIV or you don't have to not high five them or hug them or play against them. I mean, it, it, it was a lot of different things going on at that time, Jay, that we had to change stereotypes and we, we were able to do that. Not just me, but a lot of great HIV and AIDS organizations around this world and definitely here in this country. Uh, I worked with them side by side, and we were able to bring about really positive changes when you think about people living with HIV and AIDS, the meds, mm. caring for people, on and on and on. You know, Magic, after I got hurt, I had a good two-year stint where I was able to slip away from the public eye. Didn't make things easier, because I still dealt with pe people on the street and things of that sort, but I was able to kind of be in isolation, right, as I went through a lot of those challenges. But you have made mention of the word acceptance. I didn't really accept what happened to me until multiple years later. Your acceptance seemed a lot quicker because you were able to utilize one of the best attributes of leaders and pivot quickly, right, to a degree, and start advocating about educating people around HIV. When did you find that pivoting moment? I had to find somebody that was living with the, the virus. And somebody told me, uh, Elizabeth Glazier, you need to go see her. So Jay, I went to see her and she was dying from AIDS at that time. And she told me, she said, you know, you're gonna be fine because there's a lot of great drugs coming down the pipeline that, you, that you're gonna benefit from. But I need you to do one thing. I need you to become the face of this disease. I need you to go out and educate people about it. And you can bring about change with your platform. And as we're both hugging and crying, I told her I would do that. That's when Cookie and I decided, when, after meeting with her, that we would go public, number one. So we went public had that big press conference. And then the numbers start rising in the black and brown community. So I knew I had to go there to start educating our people about HIV and AIDS and giving them the real information and not the misinformation that was going on in our community. It, it helped me feel better too, Jay, about my new status and that I had to retire from the Lakers so I needed to do something. I worked out like crazy, but then I had to put my energy into something else. So I put it into educating people about HIV and AIDS around the country. Do you still take meds today or is that oh, yeah. process? Is it? Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's three, still ongoing. Three different types. So uh, they call it the cocktail. I've been on the cocktail uh, forever, man. It's been 31 years now. So probably the last 20 on the cocktail, so I take it one time 
in the evening when I have my meal. And that's it, man. Magic just makes it happen, even through the worst of times. So where did that determination, that work ethic actually come from? Let's take it back to the beginning. Bring me back to the foundation, born in Lansing, Michigan. Talk to me a little bit about the environment you were raised in and how your family helped you with that work ethic. Where did you get that from? Yeah, my father, Jay, had, you know, when you think about, we have, I had six sisters, three brothers. So my father always had to have two jobs his whole life, and sometimes three, just to put food on the table and meet the bills, the monthly bills. And so we had a trash hauling service, a truck that goes around and pick up people's trash from their home. Every day in the summer, Monday through Friday, I worked on that truck. And then on in school time, I worked on that truck every Saturday. And so my father instilled that work, work ethic in me early on as a, as a little boy. I remember one day, Jay, you know, uh, you know, as a kid, you know, it's probably 10 below, <laughs> a lot of snow in <laughs> Lansing, Michigan. It's cold out there, man. I did not want to be out there trying to get this trash out of this ice and put it on the truck, man. And so I did the job halfway, man. I jumped in that cabin of that truck and I'm, I'm sitting here being warm, you know. By the time I got to feeling good about myself being warm, my father opened up that door, man, and he grabbed me. And man, you know how the fathers be strong and he just took me through that snow. <laughs> he dragged me through that snow. We got to the barrels and he said, listen, son, if you do this job halfway, everything in life you're going to do halfway. Mm. You're going to study halfway. You're going to practice basketball halfway. He said, I want you to go get that shovel, break up that ice and get that trash out of that ice and put it on the truck like you're supposed to do. That's when my life changed. I became a perfectionist. It was that moment that he instilled not only work ethic, but also doing things the right way, paying attention to the details. And ever since then, man, I've been about that, man. And I'm, I'm, I'm built just like my father. I'm a workaholic. I love to work. And then I'm just like my mother with her personality, her smile, her charm, her giving back to the community. She's feeding, uh, you know, basically 12 people and she would still cook for other people and we didn't even have enough for the 12. But she would just take some from everybody's plate and there was a woman across the street who was, you know, up in her 75 or 80 years old, somewhere up in that age range. She would take a plate of food to her every single day. And wow. it just blew us away that my mother would be doing these things for other people. And then, Jay, another thing that changed my life, I prayed for snow because then I can go get my hustle on and shovel people's snow. So Make that's the only money. way I can have some money to go to the movies. So I get my little money. I come home. I probably made about $20, $30. Right? I put it on the table, show my mom. Look, mom, I got $20, $25. And she said, oh, that's great. So she'd take five and give it to me and then give the rest of the money to my brothers and sisters. I said, I said wait a minute. I did all that work for about three or four hours. I'm out there, my toes are frozen and everything. And I said, mom, that's my money. She said, mm, you gotta share with your brothers and sisters. And then she told me, Jay, now I need you to go out this three or four people who can't get out themselves and shovel their snow. You're going to go shovel their snow for free. And I was like, wow. And that's why I'm who I am today, why I give back so much. Um, my mother taught me that at an early age. So life lessons when I was growing up, man, from both my parents. <laughs> Magic, I, I got to tell you, there's so many similarities between you and I. One of the things that I had a, a challenging time with, and I'm curious to get your perspective on this, when you went to Everett High School, you were bused there every day, right, in Lansing, Michigan. Yep. That, that school was predominantly white. I, I went to a predominantly white grammar school, and it was challenging for me for my identity crisis. I, I was a perfectionist. I studied hard. But this clash of 
who am I and who I am I in these different environments? How did you cope with that? Or how did you, how did you come to an understanding about who magic was as you're going through these different cultures? Well, that's a great question. Nobody's ever asked me that either. So, you know, Jay, um, I think mine is just a slightly different because I had went to all black schools before that. And this was a culture shock to me to go now and get bussed across town to an all white school. And in the first three weeks, they were fighting every single day and racial tension. And so I've always been a leader on the basketball court, but Jay, this moment again changed my life. I'm, I'm so happy that I had so many life changing moments. So the bus pull up, it's the fourth week on a Monday and the principal is standing there at the bus stop waiting. He jumps on the bus and said, Irvin Johnson, come to my office. Mm. So, you know, the kids, ooh, uh-oh. Ooh. Call you by your full government name. <laughs> <laughs> what you do? <laughs> like, I'm trying to figure out what did I do, you know? So, Jay, I go into his office, and he has our best football player, who was our quarterback, he's sitting there, who happened to be white. And he says, you're going to stop all the white kids from fighting. And pointed to me, he said, you're going to stop all the black kids from fighting. And I said, Dr. Troop, I just got here. I, I, I'm three weeks in high school. How am I going to talk to you know, all the students? Because you should get a junior or senior to talk to all the students. He said, no, they won't listen to them, but they'll listen to you. And sure enough, I went in there in the auditorium and talked to the kids. And I told them we had to learn to get along. We got to respect them. Hopefully they'll respect us. And that day, Jay, I became a leader of people. Three weeks later, a month later, guess what? Here it is, basketball is getting ready to start. And sports have a way of bringing people together. And sure enough, when basketball season started, that's what really helped all the racial tension. I'm glad I went to that school. I'm glad I learned to work with other people who didn't look like me because that's what business is today. I'm glad that the teachers stayed on me about getting my grades and not just be, being a, a great basketball player. So a lot of teachers and counselors helped me along my journey to make me stay focused on my education and especially my reading, Jay. I was in the ninth grade reading at the seventh grade level and my counselor told me that if you don't come and take summer school, also take two reading classes, one before school and one during school, that Irvin, you're never gonna go to college. You're never going to go uh, pro. The th dreams that you have, Diane Hall, all uh, Miss Bird, they all helped me, man. And that's why I'm sitting here today. Very quickly, Magic, when you say, I learned how to work with people who didn't look like me, what were some of the tricks to learning how to work with people for a lot of young people listening to this? Because it's still kind of a thing yeah. here and there. Yeah. What did you learn? Well, I think first process? of all, Jay, if you don't come in with an open mind and with respect, it just doesn't work, right? Yeah. <laughs> they were learning just like I was learning because they said, hey, I've never been around a black guy. So, mm. so, so they had to learn our ways and the way we do things just like I had to learn the way they did things. And so this was a, a great example of that. So, you know, we got off to a great start. The school had never been to the state tournament. You know, I, I took them there. And one of my uh, teammates said, Irv, he called me Irv, Irv, uh, we're giving a kager tonight. Won't you come on by the kager? I said, okay, well, what's a kager? You know, he said, hey, we sit around, we get this big keg of bear and we just go for it, and we, we just have music on. And I said, okay, what time the keger stop? He said, well, the keger starts about 7. I said, 7? Hold up. <laughs> Our parties in the black community don't start to 9, 30, 10. 10. <laughs> <laughs> but I said, I'm going to come to the keger. And uh, so I went. 
And I had a good time. I didn't drink beer, but I had a good time, you know, sitting around with them and talking and uh, seeing how they party. And so the next Friday night, I said, okay, I went to the Kager. Now you got to come. Come to me. Come yeah. to me in, in the inner cities and come to our parties now. And I said, you can't get to my house until 930. <laughs> so tell your parents you're going to be a little late tonight. <laughs> and so I came in there. <laughs> Jay, I had all these tall white cats with me, you know, my teammates. And everybody black looking like, what is going on up in here? <laughs> you know. But you know what? It worked out great. They had a good time, just like I had a good time. And my teammates were happy. That's what started the whole thing changing. I understood how to now not just play basketball with them, but to live with them, mm. to work with them, socialize with them. And uh, man, it was a wonderful three years. And I often tell when I see somebody that I went to school with, I often thank them because of that experience. I'm a well-rounded man, and that's what's important uh, for me. Magic, we talk about this daily on a lot of the shows, that it, it takes so much to go right for a player to reach their peak performance on the court and off the court as a human being. I mean, team chemistry, what is your personal life? What, it's a lot to overcome. For a guy who has won five world championships, five NBA championships, how would you define your own legacy? Well, you know, I think my legacy is defined by winning. And, Jay, I've won at every level. I didn't care about points. I didn't care about all that other stuff, man. I just tried to put my, my teammates in a position they could be successful. And I understood what I had to do to win. So when I first walked into the Lakers, I already knew Jamal Wilkes, Norm Nixon, and Kareem were the scores. So I said, hey, let me just feed them the basketball, do my thing, and I'm good. So when the article came out, like, Magic can't score. Larry Bird is averaging 25, 27 in the rookie year, and I'm only averaging 17. And he dominated me for rookie of the year. I, I, I was so upset, Jay, because I said, I could do that, but that's not my role here because it won't put us in a position to win if I try to do that. So my legacy is tied to winning, uh, being a leader on every team that I played on. I'm happy about my career. I don't have no issues with it. I love everything that I accomplished. And then last but not least, I'm happy who I did it with too, Jay. You know, mm -hmm. Kareem, James Worthy, Byron Scott, Michael Cooper, Kurt Rambis, on and on and on, Mitch Kupchak, Bob McAdoo. I mean, Ooh, I can just keep squad. going. <laughs> Michael oh. Thompson. I mean, I can just keep going. A.C. Green. I mean, you know, all those guys, man, it was just amazing. And we had a lot of fun doing it. Magic, I, I really appreciate you taking the time. Just listening to you honestly be so raw and your candor and how real of a person you are. I know there's a lot of achievements you've had in your life, basketball-wise, business-wise, but I, I do have to tell you, every time I speak to you, those things pale in comparison to the person that you are and how you've handled some of the toughest times in your life. And that smile not only rejuvenates you, but also the people that see it. So... I appreciate you. I know our audience does. And we will talk again soon, my friend. All right, you got it. God bless. Everybody have a beautiful day out there. That was none other than Irving Magic Johnson. Let's remember, keep it positive and let's keep it moving.